There is one other thing I wanted to kind of talk about, and it actually feeds really nicely into this sort of case study of this man and this woman, which is that of like kind of the most important supplements or the supplements we most hear about. And what is their utility for the purpose of hypertrophy training? Um, so let's start with the most common of these, which is protein. We talked about it already. You, you alluded to the fact that this woman might not be able to get enough protein in actual food. So you might talk about shakes. So where does whey protein stack up in the hierarchy of, of, of proteins and, and, you know, should we be looking at other sources? Top of the list, um, whey protein, high in leucine, high in branched amino acids, high in essential amino acids, generally tastes good, generally well tolerated. Um, I will say uh, if it's a straight whey concentrate, a lot of people have difficulty tolerating a straight whey concentrate, but a blend of concentrate and isolate is usually, but is what most proteins out there are, and most people can tolerate them well. What's the source of protein in whey? Where does it actually come from in terms of- So basically from, from cow's milk, if you centrifuge off the, the fat, so if you centrifuge off the fat, and then you take that, what's, what's left over, and you add, um, you precipitate out the casein, which is the, the non-soluble fraction of cow's milk. The soluble portion that's left over is whey. It's what's called whey and mostly consists of proteins called lactalbumins. And it's just a very high quality, easy digestible, um, very bioavailable source of protein. Um, it, in terms of muscle protein synthesis, it's the tip tops. It, it always scores the highest. Uh, in our research, it was always the highest. Um, it was no, no statistical difference from egg, but when we did it versus egg, it was always just like a little bit better. Um, so my guess is if you had a, a high enough subject number, you could maybe pick out some statistical difference. Is there a brand that you favor or are there brands that you think are the, the best brands to go for? Incoming shameless plug. So I actually have my own supplement line called Outwork Nutrition and we have a- What's it called? Outwork Nutrition. Outwork? Outwork. Okay. Yep. And uh, we have a whey protein isolate. And the reason we did an isolate, it, isolates are a little bit more, um, a little bit more expensive than a, like a concentrate isolate blend. But there are, you know, people with lactose intolerance. There are people with an, uh, a sensitivity to the lactalbumins, um, and so an isolate is generally well tolerated. Some people with really high sensitivity to the lactalbumins can't tolerate an isolate, and if that's the case, they could probably do a hydrolysate, uh, which is a little more expensive and doesn't taste as good, but still a good option for for those that have really sensitive GIs. Uh, but like I said, an isolate is generally tolerated tolerated well by people. And ours is called Outward Nutrition Build. So it's just, it's low carbohydrate, low lactose, low fat, high protein, high leucine. So I think our leucine content's over 11%, I think it's actually 12%, which is very high. Um, and then the carbohydrate content, depending on vanilla or chocolate, is like one to four grams. And then the fat content is less than a gram of wow. fat. In fact, the vanilla is zero. Are there any other brands that you would say, hey, I trust that brand? Because one of the things that I think as we talk about supplements, you always got to be careful. Yeah, what would be three other brands that you would you would put in your body? Yeah, I mean, Legion, they make good stuff. Um, and I think, you know, some of the, the big companies, you know, like um, Optimum has doing been doing protein for years. Um, and, and most companies are sourcing the same stuff. To me, I, a good company is somebody that markets responsibly. Um, but then another one, you know, EAS has been making stuff for years and, and they make stuff that's, you know, very, very, um, you know, third party tested, all that kind of stuff. There's a bunch of good companies out there. What I would say is make sure nobody's using a proprietary blend. You know, proprietary blends are, are usually just a way for people to hide stuff. Mm -hmm. Two, make sure that nobody is doing what's called nitrogen spiking. So what you can do to pump up the protein and nitrogen content of some of these proteins is add individual amino acids that have nitrogen that are actually um, lower cost than just the protein itself. Uh, and actually creatine is like, they, they actually put creatine in some of these. Not that creatine isn't good, creatine does work, but you're not taking away protein necessarily to get creatine, you take creatine to get creatine. Um, and they do that because it's actually cheaper and it, it pumps up the protein content. And how would you know that when looking at the label? Oh, it's on the label. Oh, it'll say so it. So they'll, they, you know, like, for example, like, I think they spike with glycine too. So like, if you look on the label, it might say, you know, whey protein, um, and then sweeteners, preservatives, are, oh, glycine. Got well, it. that's nitrogen spiking, okay. right? Okay. 
Um, so I would make sure that, you know, the companies aren't doing that. And to me personally, I mean, even if a company makes a good product, if they make insane claims, I mean, listen, I would love to say that our protein is the most anabolic protein on the market. But the fact of the matter is it's a, it's a high quality whey protein isolate at a competitive price point that tastes really good. And you could get another whey protein isolate that would build just as much muscle. So I'm not going to claim that. So I would say just the ethical side yeah. of me says, just look for something that's promoted responsibly, right? So um, yeah, those other companies right. are, so, are just fine and, and I would recommend them. All right. So let's look at a subset of that. Is there, is there utility in using branch chain amino acids specifically in workouts where these are typically coming as far lower doses, right? There, you know, there's only three branch chain amino acids and they're typically giving you five grams per serving. Any utility in the in-workout BCAA? So this was something that I've changed my mind on. And I will tell people like, I'm a BCAA, like I, my PhD specifically is on leucine. I mean, it's right, it's right back there. <laughs> it says leucine right on the cover, you know, is one of the words. Um, and I used to, you know, say, hey, I think supplemental branch chains are, are useful. And I just, I can't, I can't support that anymore. It just doesn't, if you're getting enough total protein in, it doesn't seem to be a benefit to supplemental branch chain amino acids. The only thing I would say that there might be something is they may reduce muscle soreness, uh, but it's never been compared straight up with like a comparable amount of whey protein. Mm. So it's possible that that's just like a, a total a protein effect. Um, and if you're, the only, the only case I could really make besides maybe soreness is also uh, for people who just cannot get high quality protein in. So for example, if you're um, a vegan and you say, you know, I don't want to take whey protein and I can't take X, Y, Z and my stomach doesn't tolerate these proteins and I'm, I want to pump up the quality of my meal, then supplemental branch chains could make it an impact. And we actually did a study in our lab where we looked at whey protein versus wheat protein we saw that whey protein obviously had a much bigger response to muscle protein synthesis compared to wheat. Sorry, and that's that's obviously gram per gram, right? Gram per gram, yeah, we isonitrogenous. Yep. But when we added leucine to match the leucine content of the whey, we actually got the exact same response. So if you're somebody who's plant-based and you're concerned that you're not getting enough, enough high quality protein, you could actually add supplemental branched amino acids to your meals or your protein and you would pump up the protein quality doing that. But obviously the best, the best outcome is just getting it through diet or shakes. And, and then if you have to add supplemental branch change, you can't, but. Any role for, for supplementing leucine specifically? So if someone says, Lane, I'm buying your, your, uh, you know, your, your brand, I'm, I'm consuming it. I'm just going to add five grams of leucine every time. And by the way, leucine tastes horrible. Horrible. It's literally yeah. one of the worst tasting things on the planet. Yeah. Um, no, I just don't think there's a benefit to it. I wish there was. I mean, I went into, I did my PhD thinking I'm going to find the the secret anabolic, you know, trigger and, and just get enough protein. <laughs> okay. Let's talk. You mentioned it already. Creatine monohydrate. Yeah. Very popular. Uh, back in the day when I was a kid, it was 30 grams a day loading and then a maintenance phase. I think these days people are kind of just doing five grams a day every day, right? Yeah. I mean, loading will get you. So really, what you're looking to do is saturate your phosphocreatine stores in your muscle cell. And you can do that through loading or you can do it through maintenance phase. If you do it through loading, it'll saturate in five to seven days. If you do it through maintenance, it'll take about three to four weeks. Downside to loading, more uh, GI discomfort, uh, more bloating, um, more just overall discomfort, but you get saturated faster. Downside to maintenance, just takes a little bit longer to, to get the benefits, that's all. What are the main benefits of creatine? Are they on the strength side, the hypertrophy side, the recovery side? All, all above. Um, so yeah, it, it, it increases lean body mass, uh, increases strength, exercise performance. And we're actually, there's possibility that there's cognitive benefits as well. Interestingly, we're finding out. Um, but I would tell people, do not get caught up in the hype of these other forms of creatine. Creatine monohydrate has been shown to saturate the muscle cell 100%. You cannot get more than 100%. And the other forms of creatine are simply in existence to remove more money from your wallet. And here's, this is kind of like, I use the comparison of big screen TVs, right? Like remember when big, my first big screen TV I, I bought, it was 42 inches, big screen, LCD screen. I bought it in 2008 and it was a thousand dollars, right? What would that go for now? Yeah. It, you could probably get it for 200 bucks. bucks. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. You, like, here, here's a stick of gum. Can I have that 42 inch screen TV? Sure. Why? Because everyone makes them and there's such a competitive market that the margins are this big, right? So what does everybody have? Everybody has creatine in their supplement line. So the, mar so the margins are so thin, nobody makes money on straight creatine. So they have to come up with other forms of it to justify charging you more. And you hear things like, well, our creatine doesn't bloat you or our creatine doesn't cause water retention. Well, I would tell you that the water retention, uh, hydrated cells and anabolic cell, the water retention from creatine is inside the muscle cell, which is a good thing. And there's research studies to show this, that it does not increase extracellular water, that it's actually intracellular water. So are you saying that your creatine is not anabolic then? <laughs> <laughs> and then you have things like buffered creatine, you don't need to buffer creatine. Creatine is stable in stomach acid. Uh, and then there's creatine ethyl ester, which has actually been shown. So there's just a ton of marketing nonsense. Yeah, tre creatine trimalate. Do you make a creatine um, the, supplement? Yeah, so our recovery supplement, so we have a supplement called recovery and creatine is one of the ingredients there. So there's five grams of creatine monohydrate. And do you think that, is that a daily thing someone should have even on their non-lifting days? Probably don't need to take it on your off days from lifting. Um, if you're doing cardio on a non-lifting day, do you benefit at all from creatine there? There's no real studies to know. What I would say is it's, it's very cheap. You're not really missing out on anything by having an extra dose. Yeah. Um, so I would say take it daily. If your budget is really rail thin, then take it on the days you train. Any other brands that you respect and just trust that they're not doing any nonsense or is basically the same? Look for the, look for the no claims and the trusted brands. Yeah, and no crazy claims, no, no, you know, pushing other forms of creatine is better, um, and, and no, no proprietary blends. Those, that's that's one of the best ways to know. But the, the great thing is there are a lot of good companies out there that are 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 marketing more responsibly now. Okay, last one: nitric oxide or these nitric oxide mm -hmm. boosters. Uh, th th I remember this was one of the things that got so much attention. I want to say like 10, 15 years ago. Truthfully, I don't know how much attention it's gotten now, but I did see a paper about it recently, which is what made me think about it again. Yeah, so nitrates um, and nitrites uh, do appear to enhance exercise performance. So like, um, you know, beetroot juice and those sorts of things and sources of nitrites. So um, there was a recent meta-analysis looking at this and the effect size was actually pretty impressive for power. It was like 5% or something. It was huge, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Really impressive, 5%, which I mean, like that's the difference between first and last if you're talking about the Olympics, yeah. you know? Um, and the effect size was a 0.42, which isn't considered a large effect size, but it's approaching a modest effect size, which for supplements is really impressive. I mean, that's on the order, of, I, I don't know offhand creatine effect size in the meta-analysis, but it's gotta be close to that. And um, what I will say is a lot of supplements appear to not have in them what they say they have in them in terms of these nitrates. The other thing I will say is like something like citrulline malate, which is a, it can be recycled into arginine and then into nitric oxide. So citrulline malate or, or citrulline specifically actually increases blood nitrate levels more than arginine itself. So it actually increases nitric oxide more than arginine. And arginine is the direct substrate that's because citrulline is actually much more bioavailable, whereas arginine is mostly extracted by the splanchnic tissues, the gut and liver. Mm. So you're actually better off taking citrulline, which is in our pre-workout, of course. So there's another shameless plug. Um, but really, if you're looking at citrulline specifically, like six to eight grams, you know, at a at a dose. And this is more to increase performance than hypertrophy. Is this going to yeah. I mean, presumably if your performance goes up, you have more stimulus, you might see the yeah. gains there. There is Got some it. evidence that citrulline can actually stimulate mTOR, but I'm not sure it's enough to actually create like hypertrophy uh, on its own. So were you consuming something besides water or electrolytes in the workout? You've obviously got a pre-workout. Um, are you drinking your, so the citrulline would be before, obviously the whey would probably be after. Where's the creatine falling, post or pre? So the timing doesn't seem to be real important there does seem to be a little bit better response to after. Not sure why, because it really, to me, with the mechanism, it shouldn't matter because it's a long-term thing. Right. But that's actually why we included the creatine in our recovery product and not the pre-workout for a couple of reasons. One, it doesn't seem to matter when you take, or it doesn't, 
you don't, you're not, it's not an immediate effect from creatine, so you might as well take it post. Mm -hmm. Might be a little bit be better effect post, so you know, there you go. And then in the pre-workout specifically, there's a couple of things in there that are already semi-gut irritants for some people, and creatine can be a gut irritant for people. We didn't want to compound those too much, so I, I, that's why we kind of separated it from our pre-workout. But there's a lot of pre-workouts that do have creatine in it, and especially when you pair it with a large dose of caffeine, it can just really give people a lot of GI discomfort if you're not careful. So then in workout, are you drinking something? I usually just, like people are gonna laugh, but I'll do like a Gatorade Zero or something like that, you know, in water. Yeah. Um, I just, you know, I've looked at the intro workout stuff. I mean, you know, if you're working out for two, three hours at a time, maybe it's useful to get some glucose and carbohydrate in to maintain performance, but you know, I think bodybuilders or weightlifters tend to overestimate like how difficult their workouts actually are. Um, you know, really, you only need to worry about glycogen resynthesis, you know, the, the speed of which if you're somebody doing multiple events per day, yeah. like if, if you're a bodybuilder, you're going to be 24 hours to your training in any way. Like you're going to resynthesize that glycogen as long as you get enough total carbohydrates. So I'm not real huge on intra-workout um, nutrition as long as we're not talking about really long workouts or we're not talking about multiple sessions per day. Mm -hmm.